Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we're taking a look at a pretty modern rifle. Uh, this has been out for a couple years. This is The Fix, made by Q, a company that clearly has a couple of corporate policies that include having funky, non-common gun colors on their guns, and also giving their guns, or all of their products, names that are eccentric and odd. The rifle is The Fix. My suppressor here is called a pork chop. The company is called Q. It's, I guess, just an element of character for the company. Now, hunting rifles are not a typically common thing for me to have on Forgotten Weapons. Modern hunting rifles, even less so. But this one really grabbed my attention when it came out specifically in 8.6mm Blackout. And I looked at the specs on paper and went, that is exactly the rifle that I want as a hunting rifle. So we're going to look at a couple of things today. We're going to look at the mechanical aspects of the gun, because there's some pretty cool mechanical stuff going on in here. We're going to look at um, the overall sort of um, general characteristics of the rifle. Like what's the point of this rifle? What does it do that's different than, you know, a $300 bolt action 308 that you can buy at any sporting goods store and shoot a deer with just perfectly fine? And actually let's start with that. So let me begin this discussion by pointing out what my previous hunting rifle was. It was this Steyr Scout. And what I liked about the Steyr Scout was, well, essentially all of the tenets of the Scout rifle concept is put forth by Jeff Cooper originally. The idea is a utilitarian, all-purpose, lightweight, easily portable rifle that's capable of reaching out and dealing a significant terminal impact to a large animal at relatively large distance. You know, it kind of, you can carry it easily and you can do anything with it. Uh, recognize that it is in fact a bolt action rifle, it is not intended to be a fighting rifle. It's, it's basically a hunting rifle. And the fix, to my mind, does everything that the scout rifle can do better than the scout rifle, which is going to be a uh, that's going to generate some anger from a very small group of scout rifle aficionados, but let me defend the thesis here. Um, the scout rifle is has to be lightweight. Well, the fix is actually lighter than the scout. If I take off the suppressor and the bipod and the optic here, the base rifle in 8.6 with a 12.5 inch barrel, which is the only barrel length that it's offered with in that caliber, weighs in at 5.4 pounds. That is stupidly light. The suppressor is about three quarters of a pound, the bipod's about a quarter pound. It's this Bruger and Tomet bipod that I found that I really like. The whole gun, without the optic, is coming in at like six and a half pounds. That's still stupidly light. That's kitted out, ready to shoot, put on whatever optic you want. Obviously you can put some huge three pound scope on it, you can put a tiny little lightweight red dot on it, just depends what kind of range is, what kind of environment you want to be shooting in. Uh, at the moment I have an AGM Rattler on here, a 2 to 16 power, although it's a digital zoom, uh, a 2 power thermal scope. And I'll be using that in Midnight Brutality, which we'll get to tomorrow. The next thing that I like about this, uh, well, the next thing that this does better than the Steyr Scout is compactness. So if I line these up here, you can see that the Steyr is actually longer than the Fix. Uh, I took the suppressor off of this, I had a suppressor on it. That's even with the suppressor on the Fix, the thing's shorter. And I can take the stock here and fold it in, and now it's really, really shorter than the Steyr Scout. This is a super compact rifle. That's handy if you have to sling it and, say, get into a vehicle, um, say a hunting truck with another guy, or two or three other guys, or you're piling in the back of a truck. Or you just have actually shot an animal and you need to go clean it, process it, you need to hang the rifle on your back because you don't want to sit it down on the mud, although that's also a really good use for the bipod. It's compact, it's easy to go on your back. If you're traveling with it, you fold it, take the suppressor off, the whole thing's this long. Again, better than the Steyr Scout does. One other aspect of a hunting rifle that I've come to really desire is quietness. I don't want to have to wear ear protection while I'm out in the field. I want to be able to whisper very quietly to a hunting partner or a hunting guide if practical. I want to be able to hear everything that's going on around me, not just for the sake of actually hunting, but just because it makes the whole experience a lot more pleasant. Like I want to be able to hear the wind rustling leaves and the birds in the trees and everything like that. It's kind of a downer to spend the day out tromping around the woods um, with your muffs on. That sucks. Now I know there are a lot of people out there who are of the attitude that, well, you're hunting, you're going to fire one shot. Yeah, it's loud, but it's not that big a deal. 
it's not going to do that much damage to your hearing. Uh, I've been so totally indoctrinated into wearing hearing protection that I'm not really interested in firing even a single round unsuppressed if I don't have to. I've seen lots of guys who are not that old and mostly deaf, and I don't want to be that. And so when I had my Steyr Scout, it's in 6.5, but I put a suppressor on it. Um, and that helped a lot, but it's still a supersonic cartridge. My goal was to find a cartridge that was subsonic, and thus hearing safe with a good suppressor, and still retained enough terminal effectiveness to hunt basically anything in North America, elk primarily. And with the 8.6 Blackout cartridge, I've got that. And that is the final element in the fix that made it really interesting to me. So uh, let's go in a little closer to the rifle. Let's take a look at some of the mechanics here, and we'll also talk about the 8.6 cartridge for a minute, because there's some oddball elements to it that are definitely worth mentioning. I have 8.6 Blackout here, I have 6.5 Creedmoor in the middle, I have 308, or 7.62 NATO specifically, down here at the bottom. Now 6.5 Creedmoor is the 308 case, neck down to 6.5, and shortened a little bit. The 8.6 Blackout case is 6.5 Creedmoor, shortened more, and necked up to 8.6mm, which is equivalent to 0.338 inch. And the thing that a lot of, well, some people will say is there is no need for 8.6 Blackout, because 308 necked up to 338 already exists. It's the 338 Federal cartridge, and why would you need 8.6? 8.6 is clearly just a marketing push to try and make some money. However, there are a couple of specific things that 338 Federal falls short on that 86 is developed to fix. I first want to point out, as each one of these cartridges progresses, the case actually gets shorter. So 86 is actually a 43mm long case, a full 8mm shorter than 308. And the reason for that is to allow longer, heavier subsonic bullets. Now, yes, you can load heavy subsonic bullets in 338 but they are long. They are in fact longer than the standard 7.62 SR25 magazine. The 8.6 was originally developed with semi-automatic rifles in mind. Those are going to be magazine fed, and the obvious magazine to use for a cartridge in this family is going to be the SR25, the AR10 magazine. So if you take 7.62 NATO, neck it up to 338, and load a 300 grain bullet in it, you've got a longer cartridge than will fit in this magazine. That's the reason that 8.6 is cut back like this, uh, and allows a much heavier bullet. The other cool thing here... Oh, uh, by the way, the reason that this is 6.5 necked uh, up and not 308 necked up is that the 6.5 case actually has some different dimensions in its case wall, and better powder capacity internally made it a more efficient cartridge conversion. It's not just trying to be hipster by like, we're taking 6.5 Creedmoor and then changing it, so that's cooler than starting with 308. It's actually for dimensional reasons uh, 6.5 is a better case to start with. Anyway, the other neat thing here comes when we compare 7.62 and 338. The diameter of the case neck of a 308 cartridge is approximately 338. This diameter right here is the same as this diameter right here, which means when you go to put cartridges in the magazine, their stacking is controlled by the wall, the wall of the magazine in the back, which controls, of course, you know, is controlled by or controls the case body, but then also this rib in the front. That's what sets the angle of the cartridges in or out. So if I put an 8.6 Blackout and 308, they're going to stack one after the other just fine, because they both have the same diameter interacting with this rail. What that means is that 8.6 Blackout will actually stack a full 20 rounds in a box magazine reliably. If you take 338 Federal, well, on 338, this shoulder, this or sorry, this neck, has been blown out to 338. In order to hold a 338 caliber bullet, the outside diameter of the neck here is larger, and it means that all of the cartridges in the magazine are going to be pushed inward like this, and you're not going to get a full reliable stack without modifying mags. And part, like some people will say, sure, it's easy, you just take a file and you modify the mag and it takes like five minutes and then you're good to go. Um, as far as a general market thing, that's not a viable option. You need to have magazines that just work right out of the box. 
ideally, magazines that are already available, readily available, that people have a lot of, that work just out of the box. And that is the other thing that 8.6 Blackout does. That's what that and its shorter case to allow longer subsonic bullet, those are the two reasons, the two things, that justify the existence of the 8.6 Blackout cartridge. The other thing that's unusual about the 8.6 cartridge is its twist rate. So uh, the, the barrel twist rate that Q's engineers came up with and, and decided to standardize on is a whopping 1 in 3 inches, 1 in 76 millimeter twist. Frankly you look down the barrel and it kind of looks more like it's threaded like a machine screw than uh, rifled. And that threading does something really valuable. It puts an incredible amount of rotational velocity into, or rotational energy, into the bullets. Now as the bullet travels directionally, longitudinally, it's going to lose speed, it's going to slow down because of wind resistance on the bullet. That's a well-known thing. You know, Once a, a bullet has flown a couple hundred yards it's going slower and it's got a lot less energy than it did at the muzzle. And one of the conundrums of subsonic projectiles is how do you make sure that they expand reliably? Because if you want to ethically and effectively hunt, you need a bullet that's going to do as much damage as possible. You want the bullet to expand when it hits. You don't use full metal jacketed ammunition for hunting. It's frankly not particularly ethical unless you have a massively large cartridge on a small animal. But at low velocity, how do you make sure it expands? And the answer is a tremendous amount of rotational energy, because that rotational energy doesn't bleed off uh, the way that the, the longitudinal energy does. And so at virtually any range the bullet's going to be spinning at about the same rate, which means you've got a lot, you've got this great bank of energy that a bullet designer can work with to create a bullet that will expand at basically any velocity. Um, this is a gorilla, uh, gorilla ammunition, 285 grain fracturing bullet. You can see there's a, a slice there. The, the three tips of this bullet, the three three segments of the front end will, will split open and come off when it hits. And it's able to do that because of the rotational energy that's stored in that bullet as it's uh, flying down range. So that's a nice benefit. That makes this a reliable, reli it, it allows people to develop reliably expanding ammunition for use with subsonic velocities. Okay, finally we can actually get to the rifle itself. So what we have here is a bolt action uses a monolithic aluminum receiver. It's of course set up to use SR25 mags as you already saw, and the controls and the ergonomics are very specifically, very deliberately based around the AR platform, because frankly they work and pretty much everyone knows how to use them. So we have a magazine release here. If we look on the other side that is, I believe this side is actually a standard AR mag release, AR10 pattern mag release. We have an ambidextrous safety here. Uh, it's a 45 degree throw safety. Down like this is fire, up is safe. You got levers on both sides. The pistol grip is in fact an AR pistol grip. Um, and then of course it is a bolt action rifle. One of the cool things about it is that it is a 45 degree throw of a bolt action rifle. So that's the whole bolt throw. It's a very quick action to operate. I'll go ahead and pull this apart in just a moment, but first let's check out the rest of the elements here. Uh, the stock is fully adjustable. It's skeletized, it looks like a precision rifle stock. There are people who have gotten these rifles in 308 or 6.5 to use them as precision rifles. I'm not sure that I think that's the greatest idea, especially not in 308. This is a really light rifle, it's got a pretty darn narrow butt pad, and uh, by all accounts, not surprisingly, it is a rather uncomfortable rifle to shoot in 308. Now in 8.6, particularly subsonic 8.6, it has absolutely ridiculously pleasant recoil. Um, it's very very easy to shoot. In 308, not not so much. Anyway, um, the cheek riser can be adjusted up and down, the butt pad can be adjusted back and forth. You can push this button in and slide the butt pad itself up or down. Um, the stock can be fitted out exactly how you want it. You've got a loop here for a sling. We do have a hinge on the stock, it's a folder. Uh, you saw me poking at it a minute ago. It is really a pretty darn tight stock. This one has uh, has loosened up on me a little bit. Well I shouldn't say loosened up. This one has gotten easier to open um, a bit, which is nice in the several months that I've had this now, but it's still, it's it takes a little bit of practice to get this popped open. 
what's nice about it is that it is absolutely rock solid when it's closed. So you have a combination of wedge lock right here, right there, and also a second point of contact right up here, right there that essentially ensure that as, as the material of the stock does wear over time, the stock will continue to have a solid lockup. They spend a lot of design time on just that little hinge. It's one of those important details. There are a lot of important details, I feel, built into the fix. So that's one of them. The short bolt throw, by the way, is another of them. Anyway, uh, moving forward, we've got a Picatinny rail on top. Um, it can, you can get a full length rail that goes all the way out. I just have the short rail because I don't anticipate putting anything else out on top there. You have um, options here to put on other accessories. I've got a piece of Picatinny rail on the bottom for my QD bipod. And it's this is another thing that people are going to ask about. This is not M-Lock. This is what Q calls Q-Cert. And uh, on the one hand perhaps they just did that so that they could charge more for their own inserts and have custom proprietary elements to the gun. On the other hand, the rationale that Q gives for why they use this instead of the very common, well-known, well-understood M-Lock is that this actually allows them to have a stronger connection and reduce the weight of the handguard. They're able to make the handguard lighter and the holes bigger because they're using steel inserts, steel threaded inserts here. So you can crank the screws down on this on a way that you can't necessarily do on an aluminum M-Lock handguard. I can put Picatinny rails wherever I want, that's pretty much what I would do with M-Lock as well. It's a hunting rifle for me, the only thing I want to put on there is a bipod. I'm not particularly concerned about this. Um, some people might be. And then at the end of the barrel we have the muzzle device. Uh, as I said, this is a 12 and a half inch barrel, and this, the muzzle device is a proprietary Q device, they call it the Cherry Bomb, and it is an absolutely terrible muzzle device to use without a suppressor. Like, I think I'm reiterating myself twice now, I don't see any purpose to having an 8.6 Blackout without having a suppressor on it. The whole point is being able to suppress a cartridge with a short barrel and have a handy quiet rifle. And that's why it's the suppressor that explains the Cherry Bomb. The whole point of this muzzle device is to essentially act as your, your primary uh, sacrificial blast baffle to protect the inside of the silencer. So the silencer can be relatively lightweight, you don't have to have a big heavy blast baffle in it because this does that job. And if this gets destroyed you can take it off and replace it with a new muzzle device. It is also very light in and of itself. Um, in the 308 version, the 6.5 version, weighs less than a standard A2 birdcage. I suspect this one's probably about equal weight, it's got to be a little bit bigger because of the larger caliber. But um, in addition to having to serving as a blast baffle, it also has a taper to it here that allows the suppressor to lock in place when you thread it on. One of the big problems with suppressors is, well, they come loose, and that sucks. If it comes loose too much, you get a baffle strike and you've destroyed your suppressor. So the solution often is a complicated locking mechanism, you thread it on and then lock it, uh, or quick detach sorts of mechanisms, and those things add a lot of weight. Not a lot of weight in the general scheme of things for most rifles that are going to end up weighing 10 or 12 pounds, but if you're trying to have a, a rifle that comes in at less than 7 pounds, the mechanism of the suppressor attachment really can play a big role in that. And being able to just thread this on and have the matching taper between the suppressor and the can act as a locking mechanism to prevent it from walking off, that's huge. So it doesn't, you can thread it on hand tight, and that taper lock means it just doesn't come off. And that's been my experience in the couple hundred rounds of 8.6 that I've put through this so far. It's never come loose. In fact it actually got tight enough that I had to pop it off, I had to pop it just loose with a wrench to get it off. Um, it works really well. One of the cool things that helps the bolt run more smoothly is the fact that it is running on these two rails built into the receiver. So even when the bolt handle is all the way retracted, the shroud is still controlled by those two rails. And so you don't have the issue that you have on some bolt rifles where when the bolt's all the way back it's kind of loose and floppy. 
The other really cool thing about the bolt system, before we get in to take it apart, is primary extraction. Often primary extraction is done with something like helical lugs, where lifting, you know, that initial lift of the bolt handle is what gives you that initial pull of the cartridge if it gets stuck. Well, part of the issue that makes that undesirable here is this is a short bolt throw, and it's already a kind of stiff bolt throw, because it has to recock the firing pin spring with only 45 degrees of travel compared to the 90 degrees of a Mauser. And so you really don't want that to also be your lever for primary extraction if necessary. Um, what they did instead was actually build it into the bolt handle itself. So the bolt handle can lever backwards like this, and if you look at the front of the bolt there you'll see that as I pull the bolt handle back I have just a little bit of rearward travel of the bolt. So that's my initial primary extraction. This recocks the firing pin spring, and then that yank is what pops a cartridge loose if it's stuck. That's really cool, and I have not seen, maybe it's out there, but I have not seen another bolt action design where it's rearward motion of the bolt handle like that that gives you your primary extraction. Alright, let's go ahead and take this apart now, show you how it actually works internally. In order to take the bolt out I actually have to fold the stock first. So once I have folded it, my bolt release is this little spring-loaded lever right there. If you have the stock extended, this is going to catch the bolt and prevent it from coming out. So that's why you have to fold, fold the stock, and then you can pull the bolt out. I want to take a moment aside right here to just point out the trigger. There's basically nothing going on with the trigger, it's just a single piece. And you can see this big weight in the front, that is a counterweight that balances out this point right here, which is the point that's going to push the sear and uh, actually fire, and it balances out the trigger bar itself. The idea here is this: the trigger is perfectly balanced. If you take a lot of typical rifles and slam them on the ground, the weight of the trigger bar is going to come back and tend to try and fire the rifle. That's why you have the, the triggered dongles in pistols like Glocks. It's to prevent you have a very lightweight trigger dingus lever that isn't heavy enough to, to pull back like this when the gun hits the ground, and that prevents the trigger from activating. In this case, the trigger doesn't actually try to push back when it hits the ground, because this moves backward with the same uh, amount of energy, or same amount of force, that this is moving backward, and they balance each other out. It's Again, it's one of those cool little details of the fixed design. Um, there doesn't have to be a whole lot more in there because it's just a bolt-action rifle. So no, no semi-auto disconnector required because it's a manual action. Now I'm going to actually take the handguard off next. In order to do that we have to take off the top rail. There's three screws. I have to take off this pinch bolt right there, and then there is a bolt on the front here that actually holds the handguard onto the receiver. Conveniently these are all Torx 25 screws. All right, there's the handguard. Uh, you got a short screw in front for the steel Q-cert. The two rear screws are threading directly into the aluminum receiver, so they are substantially longer. There we go, substantially longer to have more thread engagement. There we go. Got the idea here is this one pulls the handguard in, and this cross screw is going to clamp it together. Uh, and uh, take any slack out of the system. Once I've got those two screws out, this just pulls right off. It's aluminum, those steel threaded inserts, it's stupidly light. Now at this point we have another pinch screw right here, along with a spacer inside so that you can't over tighten it, and then you have a basic aluminum barrel nut. You loosen this, take the barrel nut off, and the barrel pops right out. So this is user barrel changeable if you want to change barrel lengths, change calibers, you've shot 10,000 rounds through it and you've burned out the barrel and you need a new one, any of those kind of things. Very simple to do. Um, note here, of course, this is an aluminum receiver. This has a lockup. Uh, it's, it's kind of cliche to say a lockup like an AR-15, because there are lots of other guns that do this, but it has a lockup like an AR-15 where the locking recesses are actually machined into the steel barrel itself. 
There's our bolt head. So the bolt head locks directly into the barrel. The receiver is not under pressure at all when firing. So uh, you can make a small lightweight aluminum receiver without having any potential safety issues. That's very similar to why the AR-15 receiver is aluminum, because the barrel's locking directly into, uh, or the bolt's locking directly into the barrel, there's no pressure being exerted on the receiver. You look at a traditional bolt action rifle like a Mauser, it will have the locking recesses in this part of the receiver, the barrel threads on this part, you thread the barrel in, set the headspace, and then the bolt actually locks into the receiver, the barrel threaded into the receiver. The receiver is under stress when you fire as the bolt and the barrel try to push apart from each other. All right, now the bolt. This is a bit unusual in its construction. We'll start with the fact that we have uh, multiple locking lugs up here. You've got two for feeding here, and then a couple other uh, large ones there. This is why you have a short 45 degree throw, because you've got four locking uh, recesses. Traditional, again like a Mauser, you have two locking lugs, which means you have a 90 degree throw. You have to rotate the whole system farther to fully disengage the lugs. By the way, this is not the only bolt to have more than two locking lugs. The Steyr SSG-69, which we recently filmed, is a good example of one. It has three sets of locking lugs, which gives it a 60 degree throw. Also fast, not quite as fast as this. Now to disassemble this, I'm going to hold, this is the, uh, the cocking piece, I'm going to hold that back, I'm going to rotate that all the way down, and then I can actually pull the bolt handle out of, out of the bolt, if I do it right. There we go. This can be a bit tricky. There we go. All right. Uh, one of the cool things, well, the bolt handle comes out just as a single piece here. One of the cool things about that is you can change the bolt handle without having to mess with the rest of the assembly. So if you want the large bolt knob or a longer handle, um, Q actually sells that on a I keep referencing the Mauser, but on a Mauser that would require a whole new bolt body. On this it's just the handle piece. So once we've got that, we can then pull the bolt assembly out of the cocking shroud, well the shroud and the cocking tube. All right, now this whole mess at the back of the bolt here, um, we can go through. So this is our cocking piece right here. Specifically this tab is what is going to run in that slot in the cocking tube. So. It's got a little roller in there to reduce friction. When you rotate the bolt, because the handle is attached in here, this is going to rotate like so. This is the tail of the striker. The striker is going to run down through the bolt body. It's got a big spring in there that has to be compressed when it's cocked. And you've got these two arms on the side that are both in contact with the bolt body here. They're going to roll up the sides like that. And they are now in the locked position. So this is overcocked. This has taken the spring tension off of the sear. That's our sear. Right there. Um, there is our striker cocked. And there it goes snapping forward. And you can see the firing pin protruding out the bolt face. That's a cool system all self-contained back here. All right, now if we want to take the striker assembly out of the bolt body assembly, we have one cross pin right there, and as long as this is loose there is no spring tension on it. So I can just poke that out. It's got a wide end and a narrow end, so it can only go in the right direction. Once I pull that out, then I can just pull that whole assembly out. So there's your very hefty firing pin spring, it's your firing pin, all the rest of this that we just looked at. This opening here is where the bolt handle goes through. At the front end here we can now take out this cross pin. It also has a wide end and a narrow end, and it's got that slot on it which lines up with the hole. This, uh, the firing pin goes through this, that's what locks that in place when it's assembled. With it out we can take out the bolt head, because of course this needs to be a different, uh, a different uh, type of steel for proper hardening and strength than the bolt body does. So there's your bolt head, looks kind of like an AR bolt head I suppose. Standard extractor, plunger ejector, that's it, that's the inside of the fixed bolt. Now before I reassemble this and we take it out to the range, I do have a couple complaints that I want to point out here, lest anyone think I'm just totally fanboying over the rifle. Um, 
Some people complain about the narrow butt pad. For me, an 8.6, that is just fine. It's not a problem. They make a heavier one uh, or a wider one for people who want better recoil absorption in the butt pad. What I am a little less than totally thrilled with is the cheek piece. Um, I wish it were a bit longer. It, it, it works, but it's not the most comfortable thing ever. Now, I understand its purpose here is to you know, to stay light and stay compact, and that's fine. Um, it is a compromise in that way, but yeah, I'd like to have it a little bit bigger. More substantially to me, uh, the magazine well was a bit loose for me. So I had problems particularly with 20 round magazines rocking back and forth in there, um, which did periodically cause problems feeding. The nose of the round would, no well, the round would uh, nose dive a bit and, and hit the front of the, the barrel face and not cycle. And it was particularly important to me for shooting this in a running gun match that the bolt needs to cycle smoothly every single time. I can't have, I can't be forced to you know fiddle with the magazine to get it to feed. And so my super high-tech solution to this was to wrap some electrical tape around the front of the trigger guard. That pushes the magazines forward, and now they fit in there really nice and tight. And frankly, that fix works. Fix. <laughs> I get it. Um, should I have to have put duct tape on a 3500 or electrician's tape on a $3,500 rifle to, to get it to feed? No, I probably shouldn't. But, can I say, that's, that, that's what I got. Um, and that's my fix, fix, <laughs> that did work just fine. So um, those are my only two real issues of any substance. Um, the stock is, was initially very difficult for me to fold. That has gotten easier over time, uh, without the stock actually getting loose when it's locked open. So that's a good thing. Um, there is, by the way, nothing that locks it in the open position. You just pop it out like that. Anyway, now let me put this back together and let's hit the range. I'm excited to run this. And in my mind, this is in a way like a modern iteration on the scout rifle concept, using some of the technology that's modern today that wasn't around 30 years ago. So it's very lightweight. Powerful gun, uh, thermal scope, no sound signature, no infrared signature. It's a pretty stealthy thing. Anyway, I have to zero it. So we came out here, we've got a paper target downrange, we've got a steel target, and then we've also got a really cool uh, heated target from IR Tools, and that's a target specifically made for zeroing thermal optics. One of the problems is a thermal optic sees heat differentials, and of course, if I'm out here at the range with my targets down there, well, my targets are pretty much the same temperature as the air around them and the ground below them. And I can see them through this very easily. That IR targets tool, uh, IR tools target should really stand out and be a fantastically better tool for uh, zeroing this thing. But we've gotten it on paper now. I'm gonna do a couple rounds on our steel target and then I'm gonna put a group onto our paper target. So let's try it out. All right. I'm going to start recording this in the scope, which is just a really cool function. And then let's put a couple rounds on that steel target. It's a mini-mo, so if I hit the center, the head will pop up. really cool. In the scope, I can actually see the pieces of bullet flying off after they hit the steel target because they are hot. So they show up as little white specks going off the target. All right, now that was all uh, Gorilla Munitions, 285 grain, frangible, well not frangible, uh, fracturing ammo. What I'm going to be shooting the match with is 300 grain FMJ. So I want to do a group on paper. This is only 50 yards, but this is going to be my basic zero for the match. Lord, that is quiet. Good. Heard that ricocheting around. And you can see this, because I'm clipping in the, the footage from the scope. You can see that target's really pretty difficult to make out. I can see the circle, and so I can put the crosshair in the middle. There we go. All right, that's three. Let's go take a look, make sure I'm centered, and then we'll bring out the heated target and see what that looks like. All right, considering 
my pretty sketchy view of this target through the thermal, I'm pretty darn happy with that. Um, I've clearly got the zero correct. So now we're gonna break out the heated target. So this is um, a cloth composite of some fancy sort that they make. And these work by taping a little hand warmer packet to the back. So we have reflective paster material there, which is intended for uh, pasting holes in the non-heated or in the, you know, the miss section of the target. Uh, you actually want to use electrical tape as a paster for the hot section. And then I'm just going to tape this guy onto the back. All right, we're gonna plop that over here so I don't immediately start shooting through it. I can feel it warming up. Okay, it has been all of maybe a minute and that pig is incredibly easily visible. Check that out. I'll zoom in on him there. Uh, you can see the pig. You can actually see where the, the thermal, uh, where the heater pad is on the back end of the pig behind the paper. And you can really clearly see the target sticker. Um, in fact, what I can do here is change this over through the different modes. So this is uh, black hot, where the, the paper shows, that actually is the same color as it is to the visible eye. And then I can also switch this to their fusion. Uh, it's interesting, gives us a little, little bit of a heat map across the pig. And then they also have a, like a, a red hot, um, it has a threshold for recognizing. So in red hot, as you can see there, it can see specifically the heater pad, um, but then it, it doesn't highlight any of the rest of the pig. So, all right, I'm gonna go for just plain old white hot here, and let's put a couple rounds on there, right on that target button. Man, you can hear those things ricocheting, can't you? Got one round left, so we'll do all four. All right. Shall we go take a look? There you go, boys and girls. That's a nice little four round group. So that's about a one inch group. Um, it's only 50 yards distant. I'm quite perfectly happy with that. For purposes of the match, that's fantastic. That'll work really well. I